Welcome to the Global Medical Device Podcast, where today's brightest minds in the medical device industry go to get their most useful and actionable insider knowledge, direct from some of the world's leading medical device experts and companies. On this episode of the Global Medical Device Podcast, I had a chance to connect with Paul Johannesson. Paul is the CEO and co-founder of an exciting company, Smart Trial. Check it out, Smart hyphen trial.com. It's basically a platform to help you as a medical device company manage many, if not all of your clinical data activities. You know, as I read the story about smart trials, like, oh, wow, that sounds really similar to the green light guru story. And I think as we see things like EUMDR come to fruition, the challenges that many companies experience with clinical trials during the pandemic and so on and so forth, the need for this type of solution is here today. So enjoy this episode of the Global Medical Device Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Global Medical Device Podcast. This is your host and founder at Greenlight Guru, John Spear. Joining me today is the CEO and co-founder of Smart Trial, Paul Johannesson. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Absolutely. You know, I was doing a little bit of research before chatting today. And as I was reading a little bit about the Smart Trial story, I'm like, wow, that sounds really familiar to a story I'm very very familiar with. And that story that I'm familiar with is Greenlight's story. But, you know, maybe that's a great place to start. You know, what vision did you have or what idea, uh, problem were you trying to solve by starting Smart Trial? So it's quite similar to yours, actually. It's kind of the same problem that the medical device industry we saw was quite underserved. And the technology that they were using for generating clinical evidence or basically collecting clinical data in clinical studies was outdated by far. And whatever was out there for them was kind of not intended for medical devices. It was intended for something else and they were trying to make this work. So we quickly realized that there was an opportunity here and, and some space to do innovative work and, and bring good technology to assist these companies. Absolutely. And how long ago did you start the company? We founded it back in 2013. Okay. And we went basically all in on this idea around 2015-ish or so. Okay. In, uh, What's the yeah. big idea? I mean, what is like, why should I care? Why should I reach out to you and your team at Smart Trial? What are you going to help me with? Basically, because we empower medical device manufacturers to be in control of their own clinical evidence. You know, data is becoming more and more valuable. Medical device companies today and in the future will have to rely much more on having control and access to their own data. And also because you might change CROs, you might change consultants. So being in control of your own tool or system can be very beneficial for medical device companies. And if you use a tool like SmartTrial, which is thought up in a more modern way to generate the clinical evidence, you can also do this faster and thereby save time and reach your patients faster with your devices. Okay. Pretend like I don't know a lot about what you're doing. So let's imagine <laughs> I'm doing it the old way. What does that old way look like? The old way was, you know, paper and Excel, you know, making your own databases somewhere in the corner. Or if you had a lot of money, you could buy one of the pharma-based EDC tools that were designed for bigger trials with thousands of patients. But the main difference here is that medical device trials and, and medical devices in general don't have the same volume. You don't need to test it on the same amount of people. And thereby, it wasn't really a good fit design-wise for the device companies. Yeah. Uh, and events of recent times have probably sparked certainly the need and probably a lot of interest. I guess the first thing that we'll start with is EUMDR. Right? Yeah. EUMDR, that's the need for clinical evidence and, and ongoing clinical data for products. It's increased. I mean, I guess to keep it simple, what have you seen in the industry? I mean, how are companies adopting or adapting to the new EUMDR? I think there are kind of two groups of companies in terms of that, if you like. There are some companies who really see the advantage of doing this early and well because they recognize the value of data and they want to go and, and go ahead and collect their own clinical evidence in the best possible way and use it really for market access and for other activities as well, not only the regulatory side and clinical safety side. And then you have the companies that have been on the market for some time and might have legacy devices that might be in a kind of a bit different position where they're going to have to go and generate clinical evidence for devices that have been used maybe for 10, 20, 30 years in the market. And that's a task that's, it's uphill <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. I mean, I know when, when we first learned about the EUMDR a few years ago, that last little bit was one thing that I heard from a lot of say mature companies is they have a lot of these products that have been on the market for a long time. And the MDR is like, no, there's no grandfathering, you know, especially on the side of clinical evidence. I was like, oh my goodness. I mean, I guess, you know, it's still pretty early in the official implementation of the 
UMDR. But what have you seen over the, the companies that have done well in transition? What have you seen? What are some examples of things that they're doing to make them successful, I guess, transition to EUMDR? Yeah, I would say on the clinical side, it's mostly to start planning early because there is this grace period. You have this transition period where you have to, like in one year-ish time, you have to start producing some of these post-market clinical follow-up reports, which are now an extra mandatory step for them to stay with their devices on the market. And a lot of companies have seen the opportunity to start small and grow from there because there's a lot of unexpected things here that we don't really necessarily know how to handle. And we might not even have a hold of our end users. We might have used distributors before and how are we going to get hold of this data that we now need to have and need to be in control of. So starting small and early is something we've seen that can generate really good results because you will learn a lot in these early days. And yeah, and I would say definitely adapting other methods than only clinical trials. We have companies that are doing you know, post-market surveys for usability purposes, for example, with clinicians. We have companies that have started their own registries and started generating data that way through. And of course, some of them have to do clinical studies that can't be avoided. But sure. I would say the biggest impact is definitely companies that wait too long. Okay. It's probably similar with QMS. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think there's yeah. a lot of similarities for sure. So let's imagine I'm one of those companies that, you know, maybe I waited too long. Maybe I didn't do a lot of planning or preparation. Is it too late? I mean, is there something I can do about it? Yeah, definitely. It's never too late. And the sooner you take control, the better it is. And of course, there are a lot of advisors and consultants out there as well that can assist with, I would say, the regulatory side of how what, how should you go about this. And then you can use companies like us at Smart Trial, where we can assist yeah. you with generating the data as fast as possible so that you're ready for your inspection. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that's been coming over to this side of the world, the United States side of the world, yeah. has been, I don't know if it's quite as hot of a topic as EUMDR, but I think it's been an interesting topic that's come from FDA, things like real world data and real world evidence. Do you see the challenge in the EU and the challenge in the US is the same or different and why? I think there are similarities, but I also do think it's different. I think the MDR has pushed a lot of companies towards the States in terms of where to start with your market access, where to start with, you can still get a 510k, it might be a little bit easier route now. And when it comes to generating clinical evidence and bringing that back, for example, post market evidence from the state will in many cases be accepted in EU. So therefore, if you have access to and can generate, for example, real evidence in the states that can be very beneficial for you. So I do think it's kind of the same, but then again, pushing companies in different directions, definitely on yeah. the regulatory side. But of course, also, you know, in the times that we are, at least for the last 12 months, times we've had with the coronavirus pandemic, of course, has now also pushed many device companies to start doing decentralized or hybrid clinical trials as well. So, and that's kind of a way where the regulatory bodies are always going to be behind. They can really never be ahead of innovation or the industry, if you like. So everybody's trying to catch up there. And the good thing for device companies is that a lot of them have been doing these hybrid trials for quite some time. You can right. see long-term follow-ups for hip implants, for example. They're done remotely. Well, and that was going to be, you know, that's sort of the next topic I wanted to dive into a little bit too is, you know, I've talked with a, a lot of colleagues and partners and, and other folks that are in this space mm -hmm. who are involved in clinical trials. And, you know, you mentioned COVID and the pandemic. Pandemic. I know there was a period of time, certainly in the first few months of the pandemic, where pretty much all clinical trial type activity was on hold, pretty much. And it seemed like, fortunately, things eased up a little bit, at least with the opportunity to conduct clinical trial, but the practices had to change, right? So I can imagine the little bit of time I know about smart trial that the COVID situation, like you probably were a wonderful resource and an asset for a lot of these companies during that period of time because of your products and solutions. Can you talk a little bit about some of the success stories that you've seen or some other okay. tidbits or experiences that you and your team had as part of this process? Yeah, absolutely. On one hand, we were happy to have some excellent functionality for gathering patient report outcomes, so directly from participants in the trials. And that's on one hand. On the other hand, we were really happy that it became much more accepted to collect this data in a different way than we are used to. Even a lot of our clients were still collecting paper-based forms, even though the main data in the trial was digitally collected on a web app such as ours, then they were still using paper forms next to it and then transcribing after the trial. So all of a sudden, things like that became really good to 
to move to a digital platform because you remove the contact between people and we're trying to avoid as many touch points as possible. So I would say that some of those things were really beneficial. And then we also got the chance to participate in quite a large epidemiological trial as well, kind of on the side where our solution was used for, I think it was about 30,000 participants over three months time in a kind of a cohort follow-up study. Have you guys had an opportunity to work with any uh, IBD companies or others that are developing products and solutions to, to either help test or with the pandemic in some way, shape or form? Yeah, I think we've had two trials actually with the medical device products that one of them was, I think, a test kit and the other one is some treatment oh. for the virus. I mean, we like to have a few customers as well who have been sort of, if you will, on the mm-hmm. front lines of dealing with this pandemic. And, you know, at least from my perspective, and I can imagine you probably feel the same way. It's It, it feels good. It's heartwarming, you know, to know that something that we have been able to do is helping these companies address a need that the world is facing right now. So, Paul, I guess it might be a good time to take a short break, and I want you to talk a little bit about you and your background, but I want to remind folks I'm talking with Paul Johannesson. He is the CEO of Smart Trial. Paul, talk a little bit about your background and how you even started Smart Trial. What was the big idea, and as well as where people can learn more about your company? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. So, kind of the idea behind it was the missing technology designed for the purpose of generating clinical evidence for medical device studies. We saw that a lot of device companies didn't really have the same resources as the pharma companies. They did not have as big teams in-house or the ability to work with CROs, for example. So a lot of them were relying on their own capacity, own staff to build trials and manage them on paper and Excel with other non-digital, basically analog tools a lot of the way. And what we really kind of were motivated to do was to give the power to the manufacturers, if you like, give them the ability to manage this themselves and give them some digital tools that are easy to use and you could reuse a lot of the work that you're doing because a lot of the device trials, you'll see that they don't change quite a lot from face to face, if you like. So you start small and then you might do more pivotal studies and they grow a little bit bigger, but it's usually the same setup. So the ability to reuse what you're doing is really important. And we really saw that with proper technology, we could save a lot of time for these clinical studies and thereby also costs. And that cost just increased with at least the UMDR and those extra requirements there for more studies. So we really see that we are able to save these companies time and money with getting to market and getting their devices to patients as fast as possible. And in terms of my background, I've always been kind of naturally attracted to devices. I would say it's really nice to be in an industry where you see the work that you're doing is directly impacting patients. We have some fantastic companies we work with that are making technology I wouldn't even have imagined existed. And you probably have the same on your end, but we see some companies making trial results that are, yeah, you don't even read about them in the news. That's the next level of care and of healthcare in general. In my opinion, we can move so much with devices going forward. Yeah, really motivating. So that was kind of a natural attraction for us. And then once we saw we could really save time and get these devices faster to market, that was just an extra motivator and and kept us going to develop this technology. Yeah. And folks, you can learn a whole lot more about Smart Trial by visiting their website, smart-trial.com. Very simple. I'm on their website now and and I see that they have a lot of different product offerings or, or services as part of their platform. And, you know, I would encourage you to check that out and learn a lot more about all the different products and services that they have available to you. And while I'm taking this short break, I also want to remind you about Greenlight Guru. We are the only medical device success platform in the medical device industry today, designed specifically and only for medical device companies. We built this with actual medical device professionals providing input and their experiences into the platform so we can help you manage your design and development, your risk management, your documents, your records, all of your quality events, things like CAPAs and complaints. So if you'd like to learn more about Greenlight Guru, then I would encourage you to visit our website at www.greenlight.guru. We'd be happy to have a conversation with you, understand your needs and your requirements and see if we also have products and services that can help you. So Paul, just looking at all the products and services that you have, there's a lot there. And I realize there's probably a lot of similarities between these sorts of things, but I'm curious, obviously you're trying to streamline the, the whole clinical side of things, or at least large part of it. Is there a certain type of profile of company or profile of device that you find works better with smart trial products and services? Are they all are applicable? 
we do work with, I would say, almost all shapes and sizes of companies. We have everything from the startups to the corporates with thousands of employees. But we also see that with the complexity of the device comes the complexity of the studies. And that's where we can really assist with some things that are more cost effective than what you would get from other products and platforms out there. It's kind of increased complexity. We can even do more savings, but it does work really well for anybody that has the minimal skills of working with clinical studies and clinical operations. And we can really accelerate that process for the companies. But we do see that the higher the class of the device and thereby the more complexity we see in the trials, the faster we can assist and the more benefit they can gain from it. Yeah, I noticed one of the products that you offer that caught my eye is the ePro and the brief description mm-hmm. says something about collecting data directly from subjects via email and SMS. And it sparked a thought. It's like every day, maybe not every day, but every week, certainly I read about some new gadget that's going to take up wrist space or be on my phone or something. You know, there's some intelligence or blending everyday technology with medical device technology. Mm -hmm. And I have to wonder, you know, where's this going, right? Because I think the need or the interesting thing anyway, or one of the interesting things about our industry is there's conversations about AI and machine learning and Mm -hmm. intelligent devices and that sort of thing. I'll just leave it there. Do you have any thoughts or experience about yeah, yeah. How, where the industry is going with respect to, yeah, to that? Absolutely. I do think that we will need to look much more towards integrations and communication between tools and devices and whatever's out there. We don't need to invent the wheel every time. You know, we could probably expand into different areas with our product and you could probably do the same. But usually what we find is it's better to find partners and companies to work with and do this integration together, make sure that the experience for the patients, especially in clinical studies is as smooth as possible because that would then again generate the most benefit in the end for the manufacturers as well. We do also see that we've been a bring your own device kind of tool for generating patient reported outcomes from the beginning because again, we were working with companies that maybe had limited resources at that time for clinical operations and by enabling participants to bring their own devices to trials, the manufacturer didn't have to buy the devices or rent them for the trials. And we also have done integrations to wearables, to other devices where it's real benefit and where that is applicable to generate these, I would say, real-world evidence data or data directly from the patient as well in different ways. But we do take that approach from time to time and say, okay, where is this taking us? What's the real benefit of either using a device here or making this integration? Because it needs to save either time or money for it to make sense. Like those two parameters are real drivers for the decisions that we make, of course, the regulatory side is as well. But if it doesn't really save time and money, we probably won't do it. Yeah. But we do see there is a huge push for using technology for technology sake. And that's also where we kind of try to advise our partners and clients in terms of making some smart decisions. One of the things I've seen, you know, like it's an interesting challenge because, you know, sticking with the AI side of things for a moment, mm-hmm. you know, I know like the FDA seems like they're trying to facilitate a regulatory model to be able to accommodate and handle products with AI and machine learning. Mm-hmm. But there's a weird twist to it. You know, if the model needs to be updated, it oftentimes requires a new submission and that sort of thing. And, you know, it just seems like products like that you offer at Smart Trial, maybe those would be great ways to help build a stronger bridge so that we can better leverage the model on that sort of thing. But Mm -hmm. do you have a lot of much experience working with companies and the AI and machine learning space too? Yeah, we actually do. We have facilitated quite a lot of trials and projects where the product, if you like, has been as a medical device, as a software, Mm -hmm. including some decision support or AI, if you like, with some of the more modern technologies. And there we've kind of sometimes, of course, fed data into the model. So from the ECRF or the clinical trial platform, which we were placing, and then you have the device here. And sometimes these two are communicating together to generate the learning mechanism in the AI. And it is definitely, I would say, not easy regulatory wise and not a lot of, again, the regulatory side will probably always be behind because technology is moving so fast and we have these methods. But it's been quite interesting for us. Of course, we also work with AI in some ways, but we can't really start kind of predicting the results of a trial or or something because we're just in this space where the regulation controls a lot of the work that we're doing and you need to have a very controlled way of generating the clinical evidence Mm -hmm. where uh, I believe, for example, you guys have made something really fantastic with Halo. So you'd have a different opportunity to work with this than we do, but it's really interesting. Yeah. Just thinking as we're talking and it's, 
seems like, you know, some of the things that we have been able to do at Greenlight with Halo, you know, providing more mm-hmm. the machine learning aspects within a company's quality management system and giving, feeding them information to make better decisions. Maybe this is premature, but it seems like there might be an opportunity at some point in time for Greenlight and Smart Trial to figure out how to sync up together too, because all this data, like the data that your customers are getting during their initial clinical studies and trials and, and investigations, there's a need for that ongoing, as mm-hmm. we've already talked a little bit about. So, you know, having all that like sync together yeah. in an ecosystem could be a really interesting thing. So, absolutely. Uh, uh, also, there are some warning signs that definitely could be thrown earlier in terms of premature results. So, not predicting anything, but having ongoing analysis at any given time point and then feeding that right. back into the technical file, which then would be on your side, making a flag for the regulatory department and they're saying, hey, guys, you probably want to start doing something about that product because the trial is not going the right direction or something like that and making, again, the right decision faster. It's definitely an opportunity there. Absolutely. So, Paul, as we kind of wrap things up today, you pick the side of the coin that makes the most sense. What are the biggest mistakes that you see companies make in this space of clinical data and trials? Or Mm -hmm. what are some of the best practices? Or maybe you can pick and choose a combination. Yeah, I definitely make a combination there. One of the mistakes we see a lot of medical device companies, because they're driven so much by engineers and by engineering in general, innovators, if you like, in devices. So usually when we then give empower them to manage their own clinical studies or manage their own clinical evidence, they want to collect too much. They will just go all in. They want to do everything in one go. And usually we see it fails. A lot of trials fail because you're trying to do too much in once. It's better to go small, go direct, and be very specific, and then rather do multiple small projects than one big one. So that's definitely one of the pitfalls we see. And then I would say the best practices is to involve, for example, a lot of the clinical evidence we're generating will need to be analyzed by a statistician. I would say most of it needs to be because you need to have statistically sound results from your trials in order to have them ready for regulatory submission and going to market. So I would involve really early on, if you don't have the skills yourself, try to get a statistician on board to work with you on the format of the trial, because the way you collect the data definitely affects the way it can be analyzed. So that was probably be the two main takeaways, I would say. Then, of course, think about things other than medical, just clinical safety in your trial. Think about market access, for example. Consider what will the driver be behind getting this reimbursed in different locations in the world, or what will be the main driver for governments to actually choose to work with my product and not the competitive product. And sometimes you can generate some results towards that as well in a clinical trial. Those are all great tips and suggestions. I think one other thing that comes to my mind anyway is from a company in development, I usually think about clinical with blinders on, you know, I'm only thinking about that next thing, that next mile. You know, whether it be a clinical study to support a regulatory submission, but I don't usually think about the total life cycle of my product. And I think clearly today in this era of med device, you have to think about the total product life cycle, not just yeah. from the design and, and from a risk perspective, but also from a clinical data perspective. So you have to build a plan and a strategy that addresses mm-hmm. your current needs to support your submission. But then after you go to market and maintain the product in the marketplace too, I, I see a lot of companies struggle with that. Absolutely. That's a really, really good point. Yeah. The holistic approach to making the device and of course, developing the device itself, but also developing the, the clinical go-to-market strategy. Well, Paul, this has been great chatting with you. Of course, folks, again, and visit the website, smart-trial.com. Paul, is there a better way, a preferred method of contact other than just having folks go visit your website? I'm guessing there's a contact us form or something of that nature, right? Absolutely. You can contact us or, or view some of the other content that we produce. We produce a lot of educational content that's freely available on our website for companies to learn more about what they should think about when doing X, Y, and Z within this space. So Absolutely. Check it out, folks. It's really great stuff. I learned a great deal by visiting the website and I've learned quite a bit by talking with Paul Johannesson, CEO and co-founder at Smart Trial. As always, thank you all for being listeners and watchers, hopefully, of the, the Global Medical Device Podcast. If you are listening. That's great. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, go check it out. You know, these are being shown on YouTube. So you can subscribe to the Greenlight Guru channel. You can click the bell icon to get notified when new episodes are
are available. So be sure to check that out. I've enjoyed having the video element personally because it gives me a chance, I think, to better connect with the guests. And in this case, Paul. But it's because of you that we're maintaining our number one position as the most listened to podcast in our industry. So thank you so much. I greatly appreciate that. As always, this is your host and founder at Greenlight Guru, John Spear. And you have been listening to the Global Medical Device Podcast. Thank you.